Hello and welcome to May's legislative meeting. Today is May 20th, 2015, and I will be your host, Andy Russell from Rare Disease Legislative Advocates. Um, I want to thank all the advocates I see on the line today and everybody involved. So thank you for logging in and calling in. Today, joining me on the call will be my colleague, Max Bronstein from the Every Life Foundation, as well as Eve Bukowski from the California Life Sciences Association, um, Amy Akers from Angioma Alliance, followed by Patty Welton from Rare Disease United Foundation. After that, we have Michael Lasso, and then I will wrap things up with some RDLA updates. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Max Bronstein, who's going to give an overview of the 21st Century Cures legislation. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> so my uh, disclaimer here about 21st Century Cures is that uh, for those who have been following, everything is still very much in play. So um, I'm going to report on, on what we know now, given that things could change literally while I'm giving this presentation. So uh, with that, Andy, if you could go to the next slide, we'll jump right in here. So for those who, who might not be as familiar with 21st Century Cures, this is an initiative that's been going on since uh, 2014. We've had roundtables, white papers, briefings. There's been a lot of opportunities for public comment here. Um, we've seen, I think the count is up to four legislative drafts have come out. So um, they've sort of ranged in length from 200 to 400 pages. So there's been a lot of work and effort that have gone into these bills. Um, we saw a couple of days ago the subcommittee actually passed uh, one, of, one of those bills and it, it kind of sailed through that process in a, in a fairly bipartisan fashion. Uh, so the next thing will be the full committee vote, which is scheduled for tomorrow. This is the Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, and then after that, uh, we are expecting it to go to the House floor perhaps as soon as June. Um, I should say I have to acknowledge uh, Chairman Upton and Representative Baguette, Baguette who was pictured there. Um, since they've really been the, the leaders of this initiative. On the Senate side, they've also started their own sort of companion initiative called the Innovation for Healthier Americans. Um, not sure exactly what their timeline is at the moment. I, I think it's safe to say they're significantly behind where, where the House is right now, but um, we're probably going to see more action on the Senate side as, as this current session of Congress goes on. So here's a quick overview of some of the provisions that made it into the, into the current draft. So we have the OPEN Act, which I know many of you all have taken action on. There's a provision for NIH funding. Um, the Expanding HOPE Act was included. This is dealing with priority review vouchers. There's provision for the Neurological Disease Surveillance Act. Also the uh, CURE Act, which deals with expanded access, as well as uh, patient-focused drug development and precision medicine. So. Um, you go to the next slide, but I'll go into more of those, um, more detail on those in the next slides. So some divisions, some provisions that did not make it in uh, were the Dormant Therapies Act, the uh, ACE Kids Act, Advancing Care for Exceptional Kids. This was uh, a Med Medicare uh, reform bill, and there was some language in there about targeted platform technologies for rare diseases, which also did not make it in the current draft. Um, I think many of you are already familiar with the OPEN Act. Uh, basically what this would do would create an incentive for companies to repurpose drugs for rare disease indications. Um, this is something that's been modeled after the BPCA, the Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act, and the idea behind this bill is that it could uh, potentially double the number of rare disease treatments that are available to patients. So um, that's in the bill. Go to the next slide. Um, there is a lot of discussion around uh, NIH funding in, in the 21st Century Cures Initiative, so there's a totally new funding mechanism in there for NIH called the Innovation Fund. Uh, basically, the way this is set up is it would provide the NIH $2 billion a year um, in funding, and this is mandatory funding, so it actually takes it out of the annual appropriations process. Um, in order for that funding to be unlocked, the NIH has to hit certain funding thresholds, um, and that and then that sort of unlocks that $2 billion funding stream. And then in addition to that, there are three years of, uh, of additional funding that is authorized in the bill. You have to remember that just because that funding is authorized, that doesn't mean it's ultimately going to be appropriated. So overall, I think that's a very good outcome for, for NIH. So the, the rest is up to the appropriators. Um, 
The Expanding Hope Act was a little bit later on in the game here, but it is in, in the current draft. So uh, basically this uh, is a provision that rewards companies that invest in, uh, that have invested for diseases for, for rare pediatric disorders and diseases. And basically the, uh, the voucher is something that is given to a company and it would greatly speed up the uh, approval process. So that's a major incentive for companies. It was first passed in Fidesia back in 2012, and the program is currently uh, reauthorized until 2018. And we also have the Neurological Disease Surveillance Act. This is something that the, the Parkinson's Action Network has been championing. Um, it would basically set up a uh, system of neurological surveillance at the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which I think we all know this is really critical for, for monitoring disease prevalence and, and progression, and sort of tracking of, of rare and, and more common diseases. So, um, the last one I'll, I'll mention here is this uh, bill called the CURE Act, which is about expanded access. Um, I think the biggest takeaways here um, is that there's a provision in there which would require companies to actually post their expanded access policies online. Uh, and in addition to that, the FDA has to uh, issue a guidance on that. So not sure exactly when that would happen, but it, there is a requirement in there for FDA to do that. Um, I will also mention the, the Dormant Therapies Act. Remember, this was a provision that did not make it into the final piece of legislation. Uh, the way this bill is set up is it would basically extend the patent life for uh, drugs designed to treat uh, complex and or rare diseases with an unmet medical need. So we're, we're not sure exactly what's going to happen with this bill. Um, it's definitely possible that we could see it reemerge in the Senate version of 21st Century Cures. So we'll be on the watch for that. Uh, tomorrow, for those who are in Washington, D.C., we are holding a briefing which will go into further detail on many of these topics. We are expecting uh, three members of Congress to be there. So Congressman Bill Rackets will be there, Congressman Lance, as well as Chairman McCall have all said that they will be joining for this briefing. So um, I'd encourage folks in D.C. to attend if they can. So uh, with that, if, if folks have any questions, i um, be happy to take a few. And I'll remind all the listeners right now, if, if you have any questions, you can use the chat function in the webinar, and that will send a uh, question right to me and the presenters. So at any time you have a question, feel free to use that chat button. Okay. Are there anybody in the room that has any questions about 21st century cures in the legislation? Okay. 300 page bill, no questions. Max, <laughs> <laughs> so, who's in the room, um, has been on the Hill all morning lobbying members little of Congress. Max. Little, not this Max, the little guy. So he was um, in Hill meetings all day this morning with Lisa's mom and. Um, been doing some artwork to promote 21st Century Cures, and that's going over quite well, just the numbers. So it's great that they um, are wanting to take the time out to meet the patients. Yeah. And I guess I could use this time. I really want to thank all the advocates that took action last week. Um, you guys are an amazing force when, when banded together. So thank you very much for taking action. And any calls that you may have made, I, I think they really made a difference. So let's keep up the momentum on the advocacy side of things. Um, all right, you, is there a question? Yeah, so my name is Eric Good. I work with the Jewish Federation of Metropolitan Chicago. Um, I'm just curious, how would you gauge the level of support in the House versus the Senate for the 21st Century Security Bill? So I think there's been a lot of bipartisan support on the House side, and there's early indications that the same thing is happening in the Senate, too. So that's great news, but we do know that the Senate is not as nimble as the House can be, so um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're going to keep encouraging them to keep it bipartisan on the Senate side and encourage them to move things forward because you know there is concern as we go into the presidential election that folks will get distracted and other things will, will come up. and. Um, you know, we don't we don't want this initiative to get sidelined. There's just too much at stake, and it, you know, this is really historical and opportunities that we've had in the rare disease community. So we just have to keep keep fighting and keep reminding our, our members that there's a lot more work to be done. I think the Senate does see it as a priority, and I think they will start seeing some things from them in the late summer, early fall. Um, 
they're eager to move, they definitely don't want to be the roadblock on this with all the patient support. And so um, I think the different members just need to figure out what, what their priorities are and start, you know, listening to ideas and listening to patients. And certainly RDLA will have our advocates out um, during in-district lobby days meeting with their members um, in their congressional districts talking about their priorities. So we're hopeful that will help move the Senate along. Yeah. Well, thanks for that great question. Are there any other questions on the line? Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Max, for your presentation. I'm going to move on now to Eve Bukowski. She's from the California Life Sciences Association. Eve, are you on the line? I am. Good morning. Or it's not, it's not morning for all of you, I guess it's afternoon. It's morning for me. So. <laughs> it's afternoon over here, but thank you so much for calling in and taking the time to speak to us about this uh, bill going through the California legislature. So you can take it away. Sure. So AB 463, um, as, as you probably all aware, all are very much aware, uh, in California and throughout the country, there's been um, quite a battle between um, certainly the life sciences industry and um, and the health plans, and on you know all kinds of issues from access to care to um, you know, well, you are very familiar of all of these uh, different battles that are going on. Um, it seems like, for the most part, California's legislature has not been, um, you know, listening to the the had had been very uh, very skeptical of the health plans until last year when um, Sovaldi was introduced. And I'm not going to you know it's it's an incredible incredible drug, but that caused a Major, um, a major PR battle, I guess, out here in California. And actually, this is, as you well know, is, is throughout the, the country. And this, this, of course, this drug is the for for uh, hepatitis C. Uh, so, Baldi was originally discussed as costing a thousand dollars a pill. And so, what we saw last year is that ev at every single health health committee hearing, no matter what the issue, the health plans were holding up a pill and saying this is a thousand dollars a pill. And we all know. Of course, that it really does not cost a thousand dollars a pill, but um, but that's of course was the was the was the rhetoric that they were using and continue to use and have been actually fairly um, singularly focused on the the cost of drugs and price of drugs. Um, so what's happened is, is as part of their effort, they've been trying to figure out how to you know kind of what what legislation might work to kind of uh, beat up on on our industry and they. The health plans came across this uh, and have been shopping around this transparency bill, which is AB 463, and they've been shopping it around in, in various states. And in California, a gentleman by the name of David Chu, who's an assembly member from the San Francisco area, he's a freshman legislator, um, very, uh, to, you know, very San Francisco, and he is uh, close to Michael Weinstein, uh, Mike Weinstein from the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. So he picked up this legislation um, and decided to carry it in Sacramento, even though many, many, many of his colleagues told him not to do it. Um, and basically what AB 463 would have done is it would have required um, drug companies to require and biotech companies to, to file an annual report with the Office of Statewide Health Planning for any drug whose wholesale acquisition cost uh, exceeds $10,000 per course of treatment or per year. Uh, the report had to include the total cost of development of uh, production to the manufacturer and any predecessor company, including research and development costs, clinical trial and regulatory costs, manufacturing and administrative costs, acquisition costs, marketing and advertising costs, any costs paid um, by any other entity, including government grants or subsidies. So that was, um, you know, that is certainly something no other industry in, in the state has ever been asked to do is to disclose all of, all of that information. And to, to let you know, I mean, we many, much of that information is already disclosed um, um, by the companies, but uh, certainly much of that is either proprietary information or it's just simply you can't you can't um, get your hands on it because something like a research and development cost, as you well know, um, R and D is a long term is a long term um, process and. Uh, many times the manufacturers pursue research efforts that include many failures before they actually develop, you know, the FDA-approved drug. And so trying to capture that cost 
into and, and be able to disclose it is, is nearly impossible, if not impossible. Um, and also, like I said before, disclosing much of this would also impact their trade secrets and would damage competition and impact a lot of contractual obligations and, um, and uh, contractual relationships that, uh, that they have out there. And so um, let's just say that this was taken very, very seriously um, by uh, certainly the industry out here, the life sciences industry, and this was probably the most pitched uh, battle that I've, that I've certainly seen and that anybody in this industry has seen in years. It was uh, very aggressive. There was um, an extensive lobbying effort both on, on both sides. Uh, and we, we worked very closely with a lot of members of the patient community to talk about the fact that this information, by this information getting out there, this transparency legislation, it actually would not do anything, first of all, to help patients to lower costs, it would not, it would not do anything that they claim that it would do. It all, in fact, in, in essence, the concern was it could actually raise costs because this would be so, um, this would be such an incredible burden on the on the industry to try to figure out these things, and they'd have to staff up. And it's it was a very it's a very difficult thing um, for us to ever um, to ever implement. So this was. Uh, something that we worked very hard on. There was, uh, there was, uh, like I said, a very aggressive lobbying effort. In the end, the, the legislator tried to bring it to um, the assembly committee. The assembly, it was in the assembly health committee. Uh, the assembly health chair had told, you know, us that he did not, you know, this David Chu was a good friend of his, and he didn't want to stop it. And um, but he, at the same time, he had advised assembly member Chu not to bring the bill forward. So he wasn't going to help the bill get through. It was, there was a lot of backroom conversations that took place. In the end, uh, Assemblymember Chu did realize they didn't have the votes during the first committee hearing, so we asked for it to come back the next, the next week. Uh, fortunately, we were able to um, keep the votes from uh, keep him from getting any getting the votes that he wanted. I guess recognizing that he was going to lose, he ended up pulling the bill from consideration and from a vote. It became, in essence, a two-year bill, um, and so therefore, it can t he he absolutely said it will come back next year. However, as as you may know, in California, you know you cannot just declare victory and walk away from anything, because uh, bills can pop up in all sorts of in gut and amends in the budget in the budget process. There's all different kinds of ways that this um, issue can come back, either this or um, or any of the issues, of course, that we're concerned about. And so, um, anyway, we're watching it closely. Uh, but for now, uh, we we took a deep breath after the the, the chair after uh, the assembly member pulled the bill. But uh, like I said, um, we fully expect that it's going to be coming back, uh, certainly by January, if not if not before that. Um, and uh, that's that's a that's a quick and dirty. Do you? But 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 I guess what questions do you have about it? Because it was. Um, there was there was just a lot there was a lot of lobbying. It was it, everybody earned their money um, on the lobbying front out here uh, during the you know the last couple of months certainly on this. Awesome, thank you so much, Eve. Is, are there any questions about this bill in the room? <clears throat> okay. It seems like we're encountering encountering a small technical difficulty right now with WebEx. Here we go, back on. Great. All right, are there any questions on the line about this this legislation in California? Is it in any other states? Uh, yes, I understand it is in other states. Unfortunately, um, I don't have that information as to which states it's in at this point, but I certainly am happy to get it to you, that Thank information you. to Andy. Yeah, it's it's a really good idea to keep an eye on this bill for everybody interested. It's um, like Eve, Eve mentioned earlier, it's being shopped around in a couple different states. So just keep an eye on it if this would affect you or your you know your industry. And I, I just want to add, you know, for the, the patients on the phone, rare disease medicines are going to all fall under this requirement um, because of the small patient population. So this is a particular drug or a particular bill that affects the rare disease community disproportionately. Um, so it's, it's definitely something, and it's, 
also a disincentive for companies to develop rare disease drugs, um, which right. as a patient, um, we, we don't need disincentives. We don't want to have companies not want to develop treatments for us because of uh, requirements that are placed on them and, and not unnecessarily re requirements that are placed on them from the government. Hey, Eve, this is your colleague Jenny here in the D.C. office. Um, do you want to say anything or is there anything to say really about the ballot initiative? Because that's kind of the next step in this process now that the legislation is hopefully done. Uh, yeah, well, it's done for right now. Um, there is a ballot initiative that has been um, submitted to this to uh, the Attorney General. They are um, in the process right now of gathering signatures. It is a price control um, ballot initiative, and um, it's it, you know I'm try of course I, I don't remember exactly the number of votes uh, excuse me signatures you need, but it's to get it on the ballot. But it's pretty low here in California, um, and so. It very well could be on the on the ballot. I'm happy to send you know what the language that we have to to RDLA, and if they if you want to get out to your members, then we can certainly keep you apprised as that uh, as that evolves. So yeah, we're, we're going to be watching it very closely to see um, first of all to see if they get the if they get the signatures, and secondly, as um, as the campaign starts getting put together, uh, certainly we will be. Engaged in this as well. Yeah, Eve, I would love to post um, the language on RDLA's website to make it accessible to to everybody. Sure, Do you know happy, to, happy to send that over to you. Do you know who's funding the initiative? Well, that's the thing is, we, is nobody really really knows. I mean, we know that Michael uh, Weinstein Weinstein is behind uh, it, but as far as who's actually going to you know fund it, uh, I, I don't know. All right. Thank you. Okay, are there any other um, questions on the line for Eve? Okay, thank you so much, Eve, for joining us today and sharing uh, this issue with us. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Awesome. Okay, I'm now going to move on to Amy Akers from the Angioma Alliance. Amy, are you on the line? I am, yes. Hi, thank you very much. Great, thank um, you so much for calling in. No problem. Thanks for the invitation. I don't see my slides on the screen anymore. Do you all see them? I don't see them. Okay, I'm going to work on that one second. Okay. It's always the worst part of these meetings is the technology. Yeah, but. <laughs> <laughs> At least we still have audio. Yes, we still have audio, so that's, that's great for okay. now. Um, I will, I'm going to be posting all the slides online, so I, okay. I think we can, um, we can probably start to make it through, and if I can get the slides back up within our webinar system, I will do my best. Okay. All right. Perfect. Um, well, thank you again for the invitation. Um, my name is Amy Akers, and I'm calling in today from Angioma Alliance, and I'd like to discuss with you or talk a little bit about a bill that's actually being introduced today by Senator Udall out of New Mexico, and the title of the bill is the Cerebral Cavernous Malformations Clinical Awareness Research and Education Act of 2016. I know it's a huge mouthful, so we're calling it the CCM <laughs> Care Bill. And CCM is, stands for Cerebral Cavernous Malformations, which is the illness that we advocate for. Uh, CCM is a rare neurovascular disorder where uh, patients end up with these malformed blood vessels in the brain, and they form clusters of blood vessels which are prone to hemorrhage, um, leading to all sorts of neurological deficits, including seizures and strokes and, and um, a whole host of other things. Um, if you can see my slides, uh, they're, they're detectable upon MRI, and you can see a big black spot in, in this MRI picture that I'm looking at on my computer screen. Um, and then closer up, um, the blood vessels just totally malform. The symptoms of CCM include neurological deficit, seizure, stroke, or sudden death. There's a sporadic form and also a familial form that can be transmitted through families by genetics um, and affects adults and children. Research is really moving along at a tremendous pace, but we're still to the point where we don't quite understand the biological mechanism and therefore there's no drug treatment available. Brain surgery remains the only treatment option for most patients, but it's not suitable for everyone, particularly those with deep-seated lesions that there aren't accessible by surgery or with multiple lesions that are affecting many areas of the brain. Um, surgery just becomes problematic. Uh, so, Angioma Alliance is an organization for those affected by CCM. 
we provide you know, a whole host of services like many patient groups, um, expert information, peer support, advocacy. On the science side, where I step in is um, we run a patient registry, we host an international scientific conference, and also manage a DNA and tissue bank repository for the research communities. And this year, some of our top initiatives include a genetic testing initiative where we're actually helping to pay for folks to have genetic testing who can't get it done through their insurance. And establishing clinical centers is a really important focus for us and it's the focus of the bill that I'll be talking about in just a second. Um, we need to have specialized clinical centers to run clinical trials down the road, and we, need, we believe that they need to be specialized because of the education required on the physician side about this illness. Um, there's, it's unbelievable how many people go undiagnosed or inappropriately diagnosed, and there's a high level of MRI um, specialty required to properly diagnose the illness. So those things combined, we really need to provide education um, and establish these great centers. So the unmet clinical need that I mentioned previously is that there is no um, therapy, so there's a need for non-invasive therapy, and how do we get there um, by increasing research opportunities, research level, university research level, um, and then provide the infrastructure and support for clinical trials through those centers. So our challenge as advocates is that we can't really fund all of these things. We'd love to, but we can't do that. And there is no current funding mechanism. So we've established or created the single disease legislation, which is but definitely different than the other things we've talked about now, but we think it's really important. And the purpose is to increase the research, education, and treatment for CCM disease. So the key features of the bill include, um, first one is expansion and coordination of activities at NIH with respect to CCM research. Um, second one, focusing on the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, creating a CCM surveillance and research program to monitor epidemiology. Um, and then third point at the FDA level is to um, establish a CCM clinical trial preparedness and support program. So just in a little bit more detail, um, to the, at the NIH level, expanding and coordinating the activities of NIH. So the first point goes to expanding research at all levels, basic, translational, and clinical research. And then clinical trial preparedness falls under the, the centers that I was talking about. So we want to establish a network of centers, and they'll kind of be two-tiered. We'll have coordination centers, which would be the three primary centers geographically distributed across the country, where there is current expertise and current patient um, patient networks and also an infrastructure, so major universities that are capable of, of um, running a clinical trial. And then participation centers would be essentially the secondary centers, and what we want to do there is work within an established network. For an example, the Stroke Network. There's a wonderful network that is set up under an NIH-funded mechanism, but we don't fit into the Stroke Network because of the location of those Stroke Centers in general. There's a couple of them that we do, but not all of them. So, you know, we can't just rely on the stroke network because we don't have our clinical expertise or our patient expertise there. So what we're proposing to do is establish an education program to bring about that um, clinical expertise and, and bring those centers into our network. And the oversight of all these centers would be led by a CCM consortium, which would con could be composed of advocates from Angioma Alliance and other CCM advocacy groups, if applicable, um, and then leadership from the coordinating centers and then also government agencies, NIH and FDA and CDC. Um, and then briefly, a CDC, you know, we, um, we are asking for grants for an epidemiology research so that we can really have a better understanding of you know, the prevalence of this illness within the population. Um, and then FDA to some help and support us as we move down the pipeline um, to coordinate with our clinical centers to, to support IND applications and then also to support orphan product development where appropriate. Um, and advocacy, you know, there's a single disease um, legislation, so it's different than other things that we're talking about today, but we think it's really important when there's no other funding mechanisms available for, for single disease or multiple diseases to, to work together, we think it's important to highlight this mismatch between where the NIH net research networks are and their disease specific needs, um, and, and simply to point out that there is no mechanism and how are we going to, how are we going to get this taken care of? And, this is the way we're proposing to do it, um, is asking for money. Um, so that was very quick. Um, for more information, there's lots to be found on our website, or please feel free to contact me by email um, listed here. I'm happy to take questions. Well, thank you very much, Amy. That was a great presentation. Sorry we're having trouble with the slides right now. We're going to try to, we're trying our best to get them back up. Um, are there any questions on the line? for Amy Akers from the Angioma Alliance. I'd just like to make a comment. 
Um, Amy, you know, I think that a win for you guys is a win for everybody in the rare disease space. So, you know, we really ought to be supporting your legislation. You know, even Thank if it doesn't affect much. our children or it is, mm -hmm. it's a win for, for everyone. Every yeah, time I a disease-specific organization wins, we all win. So I, I just wanted to make that Thank comment. You. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other comments or questions? for Amy Akers from the Angioma Alliance. Okay, seeing none, um, we will move on to Patty Weltlin from the, the uh, Rare Disease United Foundation. Welcome, Patty. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Um, if you saw my slides, they were be they'd be beautiful. <laughs> I'll, I'll get them up for you guys are just going to have to take my word for it that I work really hard on it. Anyway, <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about uh, RDUF's um, Rare Disease Advisory Council uh, that we actually first filed in, last year in Rhode Island. Uh, the council is basically, oh, I see something. Um, yeah, we got the slides back up. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. with us. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, this legislation would basically create a rare disease advisory council in, in by state, and what it would be it would consist of medical professionals, uh, public health officials, patient advocates, and other stakeholders in this space. Um, and basically, the purpose is to uh, you know about coordinating efforts for the study incidents and coordination of care efforts for the rare disease population. This is something we desperately need um, by state. Uh, the council is overseen by the Department of Public Health in the legislation. Um, that doesn't always work out, and we will get back to that later. Um, I, will, I want to talk a little bit about some of the barriers later on, but that's basically the way the legislation reads. Um, can anyone file legislation for a rare disease council? Absolutely anyone can file this legislation. Uh, you do not need to be a member of the Rare Disease United Foundation to file. Um, we, RDUS, has filed in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Jersey, uh, but it has also uh, been filed in North Carolina where it passed. And I'm wondering if I could just ask if uh, Sharon Drennan and Sharon King are both on the line because they're, they're going to be able to add something to that as well later on. Uh, you guys out there? Um, we have a number of participants muted to keep the background noise. Oh, okay, okay, all right, well, okay, all right. I, just, uh, I, I they, will they... unmute people at the end of the call. Okay, great, then they can add that then. Okay, so um, uh, where can I find the legislation and can it be changed? We have a link to um, what I think is the best version of the legislation right now. It's uh, been tweaked in different states and you can change it and you know, change the language of the legislation to reflect what you want in your state. But I think the best, um, the best right now, the best of legislation was when we filed in Mass. Uh, I have a link at the end of this that you can go right to that and um, you know use that as 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 your template for whatever you decide to file in your state. Um, okay, so basically the process of filing state legislation. Uh, what it generally looks like. The first thing you have to do is find somebody to sponsor your legislation. And if you look at the state rep in your town, it's a good place to start. Uh, you are their constituent, so that it's the logical place to start, which is what we did when we filed last year in Rhode Island. Um, it's a good idea to look for co-sponsors for your legislation. So uh, look for other, you know, uh, other people living rare in the state and have them reach out to their representatives. Um, once the legislation is filed, you, you really need to start preparing to testify. You need to start gathering testimony, written testimony. You need to find out who is going to be able to attend um, and submit oral testimony. Um, what generally seems to happen is, um, wait, do I have that in there? Oh, I think I'm going to take it out. Okay, so I'm just going to move on to the next one. So, you, so you don't get, you're not given a lot of time. Once the bill is going to be heard, I mean, I've, I've been given a two-day notification that the bill is going to be heard. So it's best to be prepared 
you know, it's best that you have everybody lined up that you know is going to be able to, to attend the hearing because you will have two days to five days notice to, you know, get everybody together. So, you know, preparation is key for, for this. Um, also, if you, if you, you know, find out who the members of your committee are, uh, who's, hearing the, who's hearing the legislation, if you can find um, their constituents living with a rare disease and they can get up and testify, that holds a lot more weight than someone who is not on the committee. If you can find members, you know, who, uh, patients who are constituents of the chair and the vice chair, fantastic. You know, that, that, that definitely holds a lot of weight. And I would recommend, if you, you know, to try to, to try to do that if you can uh, when you're working on this. Usually you only have about three minutes to testify. Um, I have found that reading to committees, reading your testimony to a committee is not a good idea. You, uh, they tend to engage more if you are looking at them and they're looking back at you. Um, what, you know, you know your story. You, you need to just tell it. You know, you need to be comfortable. I know it's, a, it's an awkward, you know, especially for people testifying for the first time. Um, we actually have a, a video out of um, us testifying in Rhode Island so that people can see this is kind of what it, it looks like when you go to testify. Um, really, in the beginning, you know, a little bit daunting and a little bit scary, but, um, you know, once you do it, you, you know your story. No one can take that away. You know your story. All you have to do is tell it. So um, I would definitely recommend, you know, trying not to read and really trying to engage with the committee members, uh, especially if your bill is being heard last because they're, 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 they're kind of tuned out a little bit. Um, so now we'll go on to the next slide. Um, what are some of the problems you might encounter after you file this? Um, what I found is if, you, if you're asking for money, you know, if you, you take the math legislation and you decide that you want to ask for, for money, um, it's not likely to pass. Um, the best way to go about passing state legislation is to make it um, as, you know, the, the bare essentials that you want. And later on, you can amend the legislation. So, okay, how, now another problem you might find is how can I find other people in my state to testify or to submit written, um, written testimony? So RDUF has set up rare disease community Facebook groups in each state. So, you know, I, which I'll also have a link for you guys to go to. Feel free to use those states as your, um, you know, to coordinate your efforts. Um, we've, we've worked with North Carolina on that, and it's, it's working out really, really great. Um, what if I decide to change something? Legislation can always be amended. Your sponsor will help you through this entire process. Um, you don't have to be, you know, a lobbyist or uh, a specialist in, in uh, legislation to, to do this. Uh, what if it doesn't pass? A lot, many, many times when legislation, uh, you know, doesn't pass on the first time around. So it's a really slow process. It takes a long time for people to get back to you. Uh, every state is different. You know, the sessions are different. So just be patient. And if it doesn't, don't give up. If it doesn't work the first time, refile, which is what we did in Rhode Island. And it's knock on wood looking really good in Rhode Island this year. Um, Okay, one of the issues that we're encountering is the bill is passing out of committee, but it is being opposed by the Department of Health. Um, they do not want to take on the responsibility of the council, the cost, the, the you know, the manpower that it would take to, to do this. And this is why um, the North Carolina group, uh, Sharon King and Sharon Drennan, have been absolutely amazing and are my heroes because they found a way around it and they actually started working with the University of North Carolina to take on this legislation, uh, which is great thinking out of the box. So we still, you know, can gather the, same, the information that we need um, if, it, if your state doesn't, you know, if, if your Department of Health ends up opposing the legislation. What are we going to do for the future? Uh, well, at RDF, RDUF, we want to next year submit legislation for um, 
dental coverage for rare diseases or other medical conditions that affect the teeth. Um, I think that, uh, including my daughter, a lot of people with rare diseases, uh, you know, they affect their teeth negatively and they need a lot of dental work uh, and, and most of it is not covered. Uh, it's coded dental, we can't get it covered and it ex it's extremely expensive. Uh, this law has passed in New York several years ago, so there is a precedent. So that's a good sign. So this will not be the first time that this legislation has passed. So we're looking to do that in several states. And then we're looking to um, introduce legislation for rare disease education in middle schools as a part of uh, health class. Um, you know, we're not likely to get it into the sciences because, you know, they have to follow a certain, certain curriculum. Um, but we can't, we think we can get it in uh, health classes. Uh, there's two, two main reasons why we want this legislation, we want to follow this legislation. One of them is, as you guys know, raising awareness is really, really difficult. And there's a lot of people in the United States that have absolutely no idea about rare diseases. And if they do have any idea, it's usually misconceptions about rare diseases. So we want to change that. And we want this next generation to already know so that uh, a lot of our time and effort spent raising awareness about rare diseases, uh, you know, we can drastically reduce that amount of time. And we, that's what we want to do. And also, I think it will create a tolerance and we, we all know that a lot of kids with rare diseases are getting bullied. And we want to, we hope that, that you know, introducing it into the middle schools will kind of help with those issues with tolerance and, and bullying. So that's what we hope to do next year uh, legislatively. And again, if the, if the um, council doesn't pass, we will file again. Okay, and just some things, uh, my favorite saying ever, I say that about everything, but this is one of my favorite things. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. I truly believe that. Um, so I want you guys to take that away. I also want you to remember that your state and federal representatives work for you, and they know it. And the larger our number, the better. Um, when I talk to legislators, I include caregivers because we all know the impact on the family. It doesn't just affect the person with the rare disease, it affects the caregivers, it affects the siblings, it affects the neighbors, it affects, you know, the grandparents, it affects, it affects everyone. So, you know, we're about 80 million people, in the, in, including caregivers. That's really powerful. And we need to, you know, we need to remember how powerful we are. Uh, so I think that, you know, when you're talking to your legislators, make sure you include the caregivers. You know, 27% of your state is impacted, directly impacted by a rare disease. Use that, you know, that has a more, more of an impact than 10%. And I want you also to remember that we are available to support you uh, in your efforts. You know, if you have questions or you need guidance um, on any of the legislation, we're available. And the last slide is just um, a link to our website, uh, a direct link to the Massachusetts legislation. Like I said, um, I think that is right now the best version of the legislation that is out there. Um, a link to the state-based Facebook groups um, that we hope you will join. Just let me know that you're, you know, you're hoping what you're hoping to do, and we'll get you all set up in there as an admin. And, you know, you can uh, start organizing, and our email address if you guys have any questions. Great. And thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much for joining us today, Patty. Those were some amazing advocacy tips that, you know, advocates can really use in their states. So if you were listening and you, and you really want to get involved and start a rare disease advisory council in your state, contact Patty. She's an amazing resource for our community, and I really hope that, you know, you can contact her and she can help you out and you guys can get a bill passed. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. Are there any other questions on the line Thanks, for Patty? Okay. Are there any questions in the room? I, just a, a comment, Patty. This is Michael Loso. Um, I helped the North Carolina Biotechnology Center set up a rare disease uh, meeting two years ago. They wanted to try and uh, build out a special research component in the state of North Carolina. 
uh, your North Carolina folks should contact Peter Ginsburg at the, at the oh, North Carolina. Hang on, hang on. Let me get a pen. I, okay. I think they're listening on the line, too, but just in case, uh, go ahead. Peter Ginsburg at the North Carolina Biotechnology Center and Sam Taylor at North Carolina NC Bio uh, to help with the legislative component. Sam okay. Taylor at? NC Bio, North Carolina NC Bio. Bio. Okay, yeah, okay, great, fantastic. Thank you, Michael, I appreciate that. Yeah, Are there thank any you other, so much. Yeah. Are there any other questions on the line? Okay. I just want to clear up that, you know, North Carolina is not, um, you know, we did not file. North Carolina has their own coalition, um, and we are supportive of, you do not have to be an RUF, you know, member, or we will support you. Um, it doesn't have to be RUF, and North Carolina is not RUF. They have their own coalition. So uh, we are just, you know, supporting them, and, and of course, they're doing a fantastic job. Awesome. Well, I'm sure your support is, is very welcome. All right. Well, thank you so much for your presentation today, Patty. I'm sure these our advocates learned a ton. And thank we are you. going Yeah, thank you. And so right now we're going to move on um, to Michael Lasso. Um, he's going to be talking about the Patients Alliance for Drug Safety Protections and information about REMS. Uh, RIMS and Itatsu. RIMS, uh, for those of you who uh, are following what drugs are out there for rare diseases, there are quite a few drugs with RIMS requirements. RIMS is uh, Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategies uh, established in 2007 to get drugs out into the market that are high risk. Um, the most notable being thalidomide, which is used for multiple myeloma, uh, but if you remember back, thalidomide was the drug that was causing birth defects uh, used extensively in the 50s, uh, primarily in Europe. Uh, I, I should step back and give full disclosure. I am a consultant to a PR firm that hired me to help them with a project that they were hired by Celgene, uh, so indirectly I'm being paid by industry, but my work and I'm reporting as much to Phyllis Greenberger at the Society for Women's Health Research. And the reason why the Society for Women's Health Research is behind this is because thalidomide and the teratological, is that how it's pronounced, drugs uh, that cause birth defects uh, are a major concern within the women's health industry area, uh, the you know, organizations, and there is a lot of support for uh, what we're doing here among the women's health groups. Um, the slides, I'm just going to kind of go over them quickly. Just REM started back in, in uh, 2007. Uh, it's a, so I, it's, the whole purpose is to get high-risk drugs out there. Uh, initially, there were quite a few of them. The FDA approved a lot of drugs with require, these higher-risk requirements, and then over time discovered that they didn't really need it. They, they needed to be focused, and they cut back to just a few hundred. Within that, uh, or, or uh, about 100, actually, uh, within that, there are only 35 drugs that have the ITASU requirements, elements to establish safe use. Uh, those are the highest risk drugs. And again, among those are many that treat rare diseases from multiple myeloma and some rare cancers to uh, Dupuytren's disease. Um, there, there's all sorts of, there are a lot of them, thyroid cancer, uh, a, and then other, you know, broader things like COPD. Uh, if not for the REMS guidelines, drugs like Tisabri, which is used for multiple sclerosis and Crohn's disease, uh, would not be would not be available as well. When Tisabri first came out, uh, after approval, there were a couple of incidents where people died uh, unexpectedly. The company, at the direction of the FDA, initially pulled the drug. And they were not going to push to get it back on the market if not for the patient advocates uh, forcing the development of REMS guidelines, <laughs> the drug would not be out there. Um, so the, that's the background on, on the REMS and the Itasu. The There's an issue that's come up, and this is a, an, an amendment will probably be offered to the 21st Century Cures Act 
to try and get the forced sale of these drugs to other companies. Uh, the concept behind it, not necessarily bad, and from the perspective of the Society for Women's Health Research, these are generic companies, companies that want to develop generic or biosimilar products. Uh, they are claiming that there's a barrier to them getting access to the drugs so that they can develop the generics or biosimilars and get more products out to patients. Uh, there are business issues around that that society is staying away from. Uh, the forced sale is an issue that the society is staying away from. <laughs> the, there are some problems with, with this, though, because while there are some great generic companies, whether it's Mylan or Sandoz or Teva, there, the, there are a lot of companies, particularly in India, that have none of the standards of these, high, of these companies. But the way the bill is even being drafted, or, or supposedly in the way it was originally introduced in the last Congress, that anyone who wants to research these products to try and thinks they can develop it can have access. So it can be your corner pharmacist, a compound pharmacist. It can be somebody, you know, with a PhD who thinks they want to do this in their basement. Even if all of them had access and it was okay, what the, the generic companies are saying is they want access to these drugs, but they don't want to have to follow the REMS requirements or the ATASU requirements that the FDA has imposed on the innovator companies. So all of the safety guidelines for these high-risk and super high-risk drugs, while they're trying to do the research, just goes away. So if they are doing research on thalidomide and they're testing it on women, they don't have to follow the guidelines that would protect them if they're likely to get pregnant or if they are pregnant. And so all of that safety just goes out the window. And while this is not the priority issue for the year for the Society for Women's Health Research, in fact, the Cures Act is, uh, and while it's not for all these women's groups that have signed on or the, the gastroenterologists who have signed on and you know several nursing associations uh, and cancer groups, they recognize that the patient safety is a significant issue. Uh, now, from my perspective, that if the, if the generic company did develop a product from this, uh, my guess is that when it was approved by the FDA for uh, distribution, they probably imposed the same REMS guidelines and ATASO guidelines. So it's really that window where they're doing the research once they get access to the product that, that's probably the biggest issue. Um, what we're looking for here, or the Society for Women's Health Research is looking for here, uh, several of you had been contacted by me actually previously uh, to sign on to a letter to, that was requested of the society by the House Energy and Commerce Committee um, asking for objections to this because they were concerned about it and they wanted to go back to the legislators, the, the congressmen, and say, and, uh, and on the committee and say, look, there are people out there who oppose this for good reason. This will just throw a monkey wrench into the 21st Century Cure Act and slow things down. We don't want that. Uh, and there are some real issues. Um, a letter did go in. There were 29 groups that signed on, including the Society for Women's Health Research. And uh, so they, you know, they were happy over at Energy and Commerce. But the society has decided that they wanted to form a coalition that was kind of out there that had the strength of names behind it. Not Hello.
Hello? 